Hey, everybody. I'm John Donvan, host and moderator of Intelligence Squared U.S. Debates and this podcast. But in this podcast, we are going to be doing something new, a new series, a series of conversations where organizing under the heading Agree to Disagree. That's the title. And it's going to be still what we do, which is argument, but we're doing it in a shorter and more flexible format. I'm going to be sitting down with two guests. We will be talking about one topic from opposing points of views, as we normally do. But it's not going to be a formal debate where you have opening remarks and timed rounds uh, and audience questions. We're not going to be doing that. Instead, what we're going to be doing is having a conversation in depth on a timely topic from two thinkers who just happen to disagree mostly on how society should tackle that issue. So in this episode, we're going to be taking on the question of broadband access, which is quite timely right now in this period of coronavirus with so many people retreating to their homes where their connection to the world outside is online, if they have that option to shop or to work or to study. All of those kids who need to go to school online, what if they don't have that access? Who should be providing it to those of us who don't? Should it be the government? Is it something that should be left to the free market? Is it a combination of both? Well, it's a question, as I say, that's been getting considerably more pressing in the last few months. So let's dive into it. I have two guests joining us. First, I want to say welcome to Agree to Disagree to Gigi Sohn. Gigi, you're a distinguished fellow at Georgetown Law, and you are recognized as one of the nation's foremost advocates for open and affordable internet. Welcome to Intelligence Squared. Thanks, John. And your opponent in the conversation, it's different from saying opponent in a debate, but the opposing view in the conversation is brought to us by Christopher Yu. Christopher, welcome to Intelligence Squared and to Agree to Disagree. You're a professor at Penn Law and among the leading authorities on law and technology today. Great to have you with us. Thank you for having me. So I want to start by putting before the two of you a series of very short questions. And all I want to hear from you is whether you agree with what the statement says or whether you disagree. And I'm going to start statement number one. For millions of Americans, the pandemic has increased reliance on the Internet to substitute for or enhance a variety of normally face-to-face -face activities, such as getting an education, being seen by a doctor, going to the bank, shopping for basic needs. Again, the pandemic has increased reliance on the Internet for those things. Gigi, do you agree or disagree with that statement? Agree. Chris? Totally agree. Second statement. The 33 million Americans who lack broadband service in their own homes are disadvantaged by that fact. Gigi? I don't agree with the number, but I agree with the statement. Correct me on the number. So 33 million, a third of American households don't have internet access. The FCC's numbers, which are actually less than 33 million, they're closer to 18 million, grossly understate the number of Americans who don't have access to the broadband internet. So 33 million is too little as well. I testified in front of Congress that it's closer to 141 million. Okay. Microsoft estimates that it's closer to 162 million. All right. So somewhere between 33 million and 162 million Americans lacking right. broadband service in their own homes are disadvantaged by that fact. Do you agree or disagree? Agreed. Chris, without disputing the numbers at this point, are those without broadband in their homes disadvantaged by that fact? Absolutely. The third question, the user experience on faster broadband connection is preferable to the experience on a slower connection. Gigi. Agree 100%. Chris. Wanting to know more about what you mean by faster and slower, the generally, yes. It's always better to be faster. There is a diminishing returns. We're going to talk about um, gigabit speeds at some point, I presume. And basically, the, there's a point where you just don't need any more speed. But within a certain range, absolutely. Okay. The fourth question, broadband service should be seen as a right under law. Gigi. Uh, I think it's essential. Uh, rights are very, uh, it's a very legalistic term. Mm -hmm. I, I think every American should have uh, internet access, whether it's a right, like the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard for me to agree with that statement, depending on what you mean by right. Okay, fair enough. Yes, if, if you're asking me if everybody should have it, whether it's an essential service, I agree 100%. If you're asking me, it's, is it a right under the Bill of Rights, 
uh, I would disagree. Okay, Chris? I think Gigi said it perfectly. It's an important service, but I don't think framing it in a rights discourse helps. Okay, it's very interesting point is that you've agreed fundamentally, basically, on all four questions so far. Our fifth question and our final question, and it's the one that we're going to use as our motivating question for the beginning of the conversation, at least. Congress should guarantee broadband access for all. Gigi? Agree. Chris? I think that the question is how. I tend to generally agree, but for example, states have been very active in the space. I want to credit the things that they're doing. There's room for a lot of different actors, but does Congress have a very constructive role and should Congress be doing more? Yes. But guarantee is a too strong a word, would you say? I think so. You know, there's a lot of essential services that we have and the idea of a guarantee means that if I were to choose to move on top of a mountain, you know, that's very far away from everything else, I'm entitled to ask the government to provide me service no matter what the cost mm -hmm. at certain levels. And uh, with a number of alternatives, I mean, there's, there's examples where we have to make trade-offs. And by saying the government is obligated to provide every citizen, to guarantee every citizen access to internet speeds comparable what you get in cities, no matter where they choose to live, is a choice we can make as a society. It's just a very expensive one. All right, so I do see a dividing line there, and I think that's where our, our disagreement is going to lie, at least in the beginning of the conversation. So, Gigi, why don't you take a couple of minutes to explain why your answer was agree to the question that Congress should guarantee broadband access for all? If this pandemic has showed us anything, it's that access to broadband internet and at adequate speeds so you can do your homework, so you could talk to your doctor, so you can bank is vital for participation in our society, our economy, and our culture. It's just become crystal clear. I've thought this for a long time, but this is, it's actually become a matter of public health because in order to safely socially distance, you've got to have internet access. You can't be sitting with your kids in a parking lot trying to get Wi-Fi from the, you know, the school or from the library or from the restaurant. So it's, it's really a matter of public health. And we've had broadband in this country now for over 20 years. And the fact of the matter is the free market, such as it is, and I don't actually believe that the free market is really operating when it comes to broadband, and I can explain why that is later, is not providing everybody broadband because there are some places where companies just don't want to serve because it's not economical. So somebody has to fill the gap. You know, it would be great if private enterprise would fill the gap, but after 20 years, we know they're not going to fill the gap when we have over 100 million Americans that don't have broadband internet access. So Congress, it's Congress's duty because this is an essential service to fill that gap. Okay, Chris, you took the view that Congress has some role, but guarantee is too strong a role. You already posited that if you're sitting on a mountain out there far, far away from let's say even the nearest village, that you question whether there's an obligation on the part of government to get broadband to you. Although I think the post office would have to get to you. Isn't that the deal with the post office? I'm not absolutely sure on that. But take on your response to that question, especially in light of Gigi's argument. Just one little thing. I actually go by Christopher because my okay. wife is named Chris. Sorry, Christopher. <laughs> not at all. And uh, on the post office, I do think in some rural areas, you actually have to go to the post office because it's just too remote to serve, which I think is a nice, mm -hmm. eloquent demonstration of the point. You know, I, I actually find that I agree with a lot of what Gigi says. And don't worry, John, we will have our share of disagreements if the past is any guide. But I mean, COVID-19 has really been a galvanizing moment in terms of making clear how important broadband connectivity is. And has really solidified even further what has been a broad-based bipartisan consensus in Congress to support closing the digital divide. Uh, what we have is a difference of opinion on sometimes about how. And what I would say that there are two lessons I take from the COVID experience, which is for most of the country, uh, there's been a long-standing approach supported by both parties that's promoted a lot of investment. And for much of the country, the, the networks held up really, really well, despite a 70% increase in demand. By and large, you see complaints in Europe where they had to throttle back video speeds and to ask Netflix and YouTube to pare back their video because they couldn't handle the load. We have not seen those requests in the U.S. And so what we see for part of the country, it's worked very well. For other parts of the country that lack connectivity or have very low speed connectivity, it's worked very poorly. And so what I would say is that, in fact, we need to make the problem fit 
to the solution fit to the problems, which is this isn't a general failure where no place in the country has broadband. We actually have substantial portions where it's done very, very well. We've seen huge amounts of investment. And so we need to actually tailor it to the places that aren't served. And Gigi actually brought two different kinds of people. The people who are in the McDonald's parking lot are maybe in areas that are served, but they can't afford it, or there's often digital literacy barriers or other barriers. There's other people in rural areas where they don't have service at all. So basically, my two principles that flow from this, we shouldn't take broad-based, one-size-fits-all solutions that treat all this as the same, and we should tailor it to where the needs are and really tailor it to the nature of the needs, because urban areas and adoption problems are very different from urban areas and build-out problems. And the other thing I would say is we have to recognize there's trade-offs. For example, if we insist on higher speed connectivity in the places that we're trying to push out service, the break-even number of customers and revenue is going to be much, much tougher, and it's either going to uh, mean that the public companies can serve less of it, and in a, limited wor a world of limited public money, narrowing that gap, I think, is a benefit. But even in the areas where we're going to fund with public money, it's going to be more expensive in a time where we don't have a lot of options. If we make the position of guaranteeing everybody in every place, there's lines on a pure traditional voice call, the most expensive one, about 50000 a line, in, I think it's in Alaska. I, I want to connect those people. Um, we may have to have a broader based discussion going back to the Obama era broadband plan. They said for the last few percent, maybe the best solution is satellite. Not because it's the same level of service, but because you have to have a certain number of other people to spread the costs or else it just doesn't work. All right, Christopher, you made a lot of points there. I want to let Gigi, if, if you, you want to respond. Yeah, Christopher makes, I think, an important point though it, he doesn't put the same emphasis I would put on it necessarily. And that is, there, there are two main issues with regard to, to, to access to broadband. One is affordability, and two is lack of infrastructure. And if you listen to politicians and read the newspapers and watch TV, you would think the main source of the problem is lack of infrastructure in rural areas. But indeed, the urban digital divide Okay, the affordability gap is three times larger than the rural gap. So if we're going to make a dent, if we're going to move the needle on the digital divide, we have to start with affordability. And I believe that the government needs to consider whether there needs to be a monthly subsidy, a voucher, a credit program of substantial amount, because the Federal Communications Commission already has a program, it's called Lifeline. And it's for low-income Americans, and it's just $9.25 a month. Now, that only buys wireless, mobile wireless service, which is not at broadband speeds right now. And there are an awful lot of families in the United States right now relying on their cell phone to provide connectivity to the Internet. And I think it's important to say it does not provide broadband speeds. It may one day, but it does not now. So we really need to look seriously at how do we make broadband affordable. Now, why isn't broadband affordable? We can talk about that. And this is where Christopher and I are definitely going to disagree. It's a lack of competition in this country. It's lack of competition due to consolidation and deregulation. And I think we can cure it. And I have some ideas about how Congress can start to cure the competition gap. Because we have more competition you have faster speeds and you have lower prices and you have less of a need for Congress to spend tens of billions of dollars, which is what's going to take both for infrastructure and for affordability. This is Intelligence Squared U.S. More debate in just a moment. So there's one other thing I'd like to address here, John, if I could, and it, and it goes to the, the point about there not being enough competition for broadband in this country. And even under the FCC's extraordinarily and overly rosy numbers, many, many Americans don't have a choice of more than two broadband providers at the lowest speeds they consider broadband. And that is that in 19 states, cities and towns are prohibited from building their own broadband networks. And why is that important? Well, cities and towns have different incentives than big companies like Comcast and AT&T who need to make a return on investment. Cities and towns can fill those gaps with people who are not being served by providing lower cost service, by serving exurban areas that uh, some of these big companies don't serve. 
What, what's an example of a place, just so that we understand, where this is happening, of a community that has done that, and how does it operate? There's about 900 communities who have some sort of community-supported broadband, and there's different models. Some of the ones that are talked about the most are Chattanooga, Tennessee, which has its own municipal utility that it also turned into a broadband network. But is it free, is it free to users? No, 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 no. Oh, no, no. But it's much cheaper. Okay. Uh, and it is caused, usually causes the incumbent broadband provider to lower its prices and raise its speed. Longmont, Colorado is a great example. It has gigabit speeds, which is like super, super fast for only sixty nine ninety five. Now, I'll tell you, I pay $80 a month for 75 megabits per second symmetrical, and that's more than 10 times faster. Uh, Holly Springs, North Carolina, Fairlawn, Ohio, which is a suburb of Akron. So again, there's 900 communities, but again, in 19 states, the incumbent broadband providers asked and succeeded in getting the state legislatures to block communities from either expanding their networks, if they had one already, or building one in the first place. And their reasons were? Well, the cited reasons are that private enterprise shouldn't have to compete with, you know, a government-owned networks, mm-hmm. with taxpayer-supported networks. That's, that's their argument. The problem with that argument, if I could just say, is number one, private companies depend on public rights of way. They are being subsidized by the government to begin with. And number two, in a lot of these places, like community broadband isn't for everyone. We don't necessarily need it in Washington, D.C. or in New York City. But in places like Chattanooga, if you go five miles outside the city line, there's nobody serving them. Mm-hmm. Right. So the, the, the infrastructure divide isn't just rural. It's oftentimes exurban as well. And that's where communities can fill in the gaps where private companies, where the incumbent companies don't want to serve. I'd like to get Christopher's take on this as a solution. So I believe in data. The idea of municipal fiber is a brilliant idea. It's very attractive. And I think that it's very appealing to a lot of municipal leaders. What I actually find is I want to infor- look at what the actual uh, experience of the cities that have built this has had. And so I actually pulled in a study, I pulled the audited financial statements for every municipal fiber bill in the U.S. that published them. And the results I found were there are some success stories. About 20 percent seem to be doing well. 70 percent of them are actually operating in the red year on year. So they borrowed a bunch of money and they're going further in the hole with every passing year. And of that 70 percent, 50 percent are still alive. 20 percent have already gone bankrupt. And there is a 10 percent that is operating in the black, but not enough to repay their debt. So when I presented these results at the U.S. Conference of Mayors and the National League of Cities, they found it pretty sobering, which is I'm not saying that this is a don't do it. There there are some success stories, but you have to understand that you have to do this with both eyes open. And what you start to see is uh, the studies also suggest that, in fact, these companies don't charge significantly less than the private providers. And this is something we've learned going back to the whole privatization era for the last hundred years. And that in addition to the level playing field story that Gigi mentioned, there are some regulatory asymmetries. Um, City owned uh, utilities often don't have to obey, like give access to polls and other things that are very important. But there's also um, some interesting problems. There's some statewide investigations of some localized corruption and some other basic problems, which I'm happy to discuss at length with anyone who's interested, but also some democratic evasion, where one of the cities. If it was a bond, they had to put it to a public vote, which is what you usually require. They used a different financing mechanism to avoid that. And when asked why, they said, what? We would, we would have lost. Mm-hmm. And some part of me says that if the people wouldn't support it, that's not a good reason not to follow those processes. So states have had other reasons beyond the ones that Gigi mentioned, and they're complex. But it's one of those things where once a state decides that, the Supreme Court has said the relationship between the state and the city is up to the state. Let's take one more round on this point, because I I get the sense, uh, Gigi, that you want to respond to some of what Christopher said. Yes, I I do. Companies, private companies fail all the time, too. (laughs) It's an awful lot of companies, particularly in Silicon Valley, who haven't made a penny and keep getting venture capitalist money over venture capitalist money. So, you know, look, private entities fail, public entities fail. That's really not the point. And I don't disagree that a town or city shouldn't go into this with their eyes wide open. This is this is a lot of money. But this is about filling gaps and this is about providing competition which is sorely lacking in the United States. And as I said before, 
cities and towns don't have to make a return on investment. Maybe some of them do run in the red, and maybe that's not the end of the world if all of their citizens are being served. I just think particularly now, taking this option off the table is very problematic. The community broadband model that you're seeing most often now, as opposed to, let's say, five or 10 years ago, is one where a community builds the infrastructure and then makes it available to private companies to provide what they call the last mile, so that last wire to the house. Number one, I think that's a terrific way of getting a lot of competition. Utah has a, a network called Utopia. So Utah's law does prohibits a community from providing retail service. So Utopia has to make their network available to any commercial ISP that wants to provide service. And in five towns, they have a choice of something like 12 ISPs. Can you imagine that? That reminds me of, you know, the early days of dial-up where the average American had access to 13 different dial-up ISPs. I love that model. This way, you're not concerned about the government providing retail service, although it does work in places like Chattanooga and Fairlawn, Ohio. But you have tons of competition and private entities can make money. All right. So so the word is utopia. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Christopher, can you respond to Utopia? Absolutely. So, I mean, to me, Utopia is a great example of one of these projects gone bad. So many of the many cities do approach things understanding they may lose money and you write the proposal in a certain way, like schools. You have a tax a set aside in your tax revenue and you're going to retire it and you do that both eyes open. Uh, Concord, Massachusetts did this. There's a lot of great examples of this. Many places are sold on the idea that this will not cost you any money. This is, in fact, going to make you money. And in fact, if you look at the Utopia bond issue, they had no provision for coming out to federal money, I mean, having to fund this sort of fund. They expected it to break even. And we're not talking about making money, but they do have to repay the bond. I mean, they do have to get that much money back because that is due to the bondholders the minute you issue it. And that's real. What's interesting is Utopia was insolvent after it began. They borrowed about $270 million, if I remember right. After they started going bad, they doubled for 20 years. They doubled down on like about 490 million across 30 years. And all the cities, about a dozen cities, have been tapped for the maximum amount allowed by the bond to come up with taxpayer revenue, which was not in the original plan. So they were sold a bill. Of, and if you read the documents, they were not told, yes, businesses go bad. They were not told the usual disclaimers. They said, this is going to work out great. We're going to get something for nothing. Gigi, can you take 15 seconds to respond? And then, Christopher, you get the last word. Yeah, well, Utopia did have some lean years, but now it's making money. So the taxpayers will be paid back. Christopher? The numbers suggest that they are so far in the hole that they will struggle. But uh, this is one of these great empirical questions which we can actually study and learn from. More debate coming up from Intelligence Squared U.S. So what I hear us saying, we're talking about two issues of access. One is, do you live in a place where the signal actually reaches you somehow through the air or through a cable? The other kind of access is the signal's near your house, but you can't afford it. That those are the two categories that we're talking about. And you you seem to be making more of a stand Gigi on the second issue that you're talking about. If Congress is going to get involved where the dollars should be spent most urgently, I think most urgently, would be on getting access to people who have the signal but can't afford it, which is a question of pricing. Uh, Do I have that? I I think they're both important. Okay. It's just a matter of emphasis and also a matter of what government is doing right now. So the Federal Communications Commission has access to a pot of money. It's called the Universal Service Fund. And it goes for that lifeline program I just talked about. It goes for rural health care, which meaning connecting hospitals and other rural health care facilities to broadband. Uh, it goes to connect schools and libraries to broadband. It's something called the E-Rate program. And finally, there's a program that the FCC just recently renamed. It used to be called the Connect America Fund. It's now called the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, where the FCC pays rural broadband companies to build networks in places that don't have it in rural America. Mm -hmm. Well, the FCC just announced an auction of $20.4 billion to connect rural America. And over the last 10 years, it's spent about $100 billion. Whereas the amount of money spent on affordability has been a fraction of that. So what I, I guess what I'm saying is 
the money spent needs to be proportionate to the problem. I think they're both important, Mm -hmm. but affordability, this Federal Communications Commission almost never talks about it. All right, let's let uh, Christopher back into the conversation. Christopher, do you you hear anything right there that you would want to respond to? So I would uh, make one little complexity, which is you talked about, John, two areas. The areas that are unserved and the places that are unaffordable. And as Gigi says, for lack of competition, there actually does exist competition in some areas. And so what I would say is there's sort of three areas, ones that have multiple providers, one where you have a single provider and you have an unserved area, which again sort of narrows our problem a little bit, which is areas where you have more effective competition, you actually can get better service and you have seen that sort of rivalry push things forward. And so again, to try to target the limited resources we have in the best way, um, I think Gigi says very nicely, we have to make trade-offs. I mean, we have to make decisions, um, we have a finite amount of money to allocate between the two. Uh, And she would allocate more to affordability. And frankly, I think that's part of the solution. What's interesting is if you you look at the survey data, a lot of the resistance comes from other things, such as lack of digital literacy skills. The other thing is lack of relevance. There was a great study by a company called Connected Nation, an outfit that's from Kentucky that specializes in connecting rural communities, and some staffers from the FCC during the, I think it was during the Obama administration. And they actually surveyed the one third of the people who were, had broadband available to them but didn't sign up. Two thirds of those people wouldn't take it even if it were free because they didn't see that they needed it. But I think that particular problem is going to be much, much harder. And in fact, what we've learned is uh, the empirical studies I've seen about how the ex- Lifeline program works for connecting people to traditional voice show that it hasn't been that effective and that a lot of the money has been not very well targeted, I think we can learn a lot from the past and reshape this program in ways that make that more effective, but also we'll need to overcome barriers aside from just cost. Uh, If I could, John, if I could just speak to some of what Christopher said. I mean, look, claims of non-relevance are often tied to other barriers, including the cost of internet access, lack of digital literacy, which is an issue, and also equipment costs, which we, we shouldn't forget about either. You know, sometimes people are embarrassed to say, well, I can't afford it. So they'll say, well, it's not relevant. And, and the Pew Research Center has done the study showing that, you know, 80% of the people they asked said that cost was the barrier, the reason that they didn't have it. Let me speak to the Lifeline program a little bit, because I do think it is time to think much bigger than $9.25. But I wrote an article for Wired Magazine uh, uh, in April about why the Lifeline program hasn't been working very well under this. Gigi, before you do that, can yeah. you, you have mentioned Lifeline, both of you, a couple of times. And the first time, the first pass, you did do a little bit of a description of it. But just flesh it out sure. for people who aren't familiar with it a little bit more and then go on to make your sure. point. So the Lifeline program is one of the four universal service programs that the Federal Communications Commission uh, administers. And it is specifically a subsidy for low-income Americans. So if you have a a certain percentage of income above the poverty line, the federal poverty line, or if you get assistance from, let's say, um, Social Security or from Medicaid or from SNAP, which is the uh, Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, you're eligible for Lifeline. But it is only $9.25 a month, which means the vast majority of people, because the, the subsidy is so low, use it for for mobile telephone service. But this FCC has specifically tried to make it harder for people to get Lifeline. I think it's also important to note, and I should have said this at the outset, that Lifeline was actually started in the Reagan administration, and it was expanded to wireless, mobile wireless, by the George W. Bush FCC, and then expanded to broadband by the Obama FCC when I was there. So this notion that it's, you know, these phones that Lifeline recipients get are Obama phones or a bunch of nonsense. It was started by Reagan. But the fact of the matter is, is that the need and the expense has far outgrown what the subsidy is today. And you were mentioning that you wrote an article. Uh, Is that what you said in the article? Well, what I said in the article was that this FCC has erected so many barriers to eligibility that the number of participants in the program has gone down by 40% since early 2017, and the budget has gone down by a half because fewer and fewer and fewer people are participating. So, so again, to bring it back to the time we're in coronavirus, if we're talking about creating access for people who don't have access, are we talking about compelling or, or strongly trying to persuade private industry to do something that they wouldn't do on their own? And how, would that, how will that work? 
Should the money come from the taxpayer or should there be a significant chip in from the companies themselves? I'd love to see the companies chip in. Okay, But you're not asking for that. <laughs> no, I'm not asking for that because we've had broadband for over 20 years in this country and we still have tens of millions of Americans without broadband. I think at this point in time, it's going to take it's going to take the taxpayer to step up just like we did with the telephone system, you know, just like we did with the electric system and water. Congress is going to have to step up and fill the gaps. Christopher? So we actually have a fundamental problem, which is a lot of the ability to serve areas is a matter of population density. If you lay a wire and you can only serve one customer from it, you have to recover all the costs from one customer and it's just not going to happen. If you have 10, it's easier. If 100, 1,000, it gets easier and easier. One of the first things that happened under the Obama administration is they wrote something called the National Broadband Plan. And they were trying to extend the internet to most of Americans, but even they admitted the last few percent are probably going to be served by satellite. I think the funding source should come from general revenues from Congress. That right now we've been historically funding this with a tax on long distance voice. And I don't know when the last time you made a long distance phone call that you paid for, John, but it's been a while for us. And we know from the data that revenue is plummeting like a stone. I mean, that's just not, it doesn't make sense in the modern era and it's not sustainable. The question is, would you then, okay, if a rural area, for example, need a new hospital or needed a new um, school, would we tax the telephone companies? There's a general principle of public finance. Those things, a school provides general benefits to society and we pay for them out of general revenues. I do think if you are getting taxpayer dollars to build in rural areas, like these, these small rural companies I was talking about before, you should have to provide a low cost broadband service to your low income customers. Do either of you conceive of the internet basically as a public utility? Does it seem to match that concept for either of you? Christopher, you can go first on that. I do not. I did actually a study of utility regulation and found out when it works, treating things as public utilities. And there's some interesting success stories and failure stories. In general, it works for things like natural gas, water, electric power, where the demands are very steady. The network is not being expanded. You don't have to reinvest in it. You just have to maintain it. And the technology hasn't changed in decades, if not going on a century. And in that case, it's actually worked out really well. And to some extent, telephone was like that too, because you only were doing one thing with it, voice. And it was very, very simple. The way things are going now, the modern internet requires, an internet provider has to, it's a very product. The technology is changing rapidly. The nature of it requires constant reinvestment. And the total demand is growing at a rate that no water or electric power system has ever seen. Mm -hmm. And so the, the demands to try to reinvest are really, really tough. I'll give you one example. Many people think the U.S. has had a private telephone system. We're, in fact, the only country that did. The federal government took it over for one year in World War I, along with a lot of other things. The question was, why did they ever give it back? It's because running the system caused prices to run up so high, these government people were overseeing having to jack up the prices themselves, and they, had to, they were investing in new switches, and there were all these technological things happening at the time. They decided this is not the kind of dynamic environment that we think government ownership is working very well for. Gigi? So if by public utility you mean an essential service like water, like electricity, something that is necessary to live. I want to add one layer to it that yeah. tends to be in a monopoly situation because there are so many parts of the country that have only one or two ISPs available to them. So I want to add that layer to it yeah. as well. So if we're talking about the internet being a utility like electricity and water that is vital to full participation in a good life in society, absolutely. If you're talking about a utility that ought to have its rates regulated by the government, I would say no. So I do think that people really get in the weeds of this utility argument. If you ask most Americans, and I don't care if they're Republican or Democrats or what have you, is the internet a utility? They will say yes. And they will say yes, not because they want the government to regulate it, whether it be a monopoly or not, but to the extent that they believe that it's essential, as essential as water and electricity. And quite honestly, I think some people would rather do without their water and electricity before they would do without their broadband. So it's kind of like asking, is the Internet a right? I think sometimes you can get bogged down in the legalese and the weeds and the history 
where the fact of the matter is, is everybody needs it, particularly now and frankly in the future. It's not going to change when the pandemic is over, whenever that is. Mm -hmm. So why shouldn't Congress step up and make sure that everybody has it? I've been hearing throughout this conversation that there is a lot of common ground between the two of you, just some disagreement in means, but not necessarily towards goals. As we wrap up, I would just like to ask you each to take 30 or 40 seconds to talk about your fears of what will happen if the coronavirus crisis continues to such a degree that the challenges that people are facing right now in regard to broadband are still in place, say, a year from now. Let's hope that they're not. What will be the consequences in terms of healthcare, in terms of education, Christopher, if, we, if we're still in this place nine, 10 months out from here? And what worries you? What worries me is we won't learn from the past. I do think we need to solve this problem, but many people try to simplify it and make it very uh, flat, whereas I see it as a very complex problem. I have a paper about building on tribal lands. A big part of the unserved populations are on Indian reservations. Almost all the things we talked about, all the federal programs we're talking about, don't work on tribal lands. So if we're going to try, even the whole conversation we've had has just not even addressed a huge part of the population that we need to break this down sort of population by population like a policy wonk would and figure out solutions that are going to work for those areas. Second, we spent $7 billion in stimulus money in 2008 and we didn't get very much for it. Even the rural utility service that administered part of it, they said their program is going to connect 7 million people to the internet. They admit for their 7 bill they connected connected or enhanced the service of 300,000 people. Now, there's a story there that we need to learn from, that there are many great efforts to connect more and more people. So much of this is moving over from the old voice world that just doesn't fit in the world very well. We need to start thinking much more creatively about this problem. And to me, much more in an area where actually I do believe it is bipartisan, where it's not as divided. We can actually start to craft, I think, good middle ground solutions. Thanks for those thoughts, Christopher. And Gigi, how about you in terms of if we're here for an extended period of time and we don't get it solved, what worries you? What worries me most is that those who are already behind and have been pushed even further behind because of this pandemic are going to fall even further behind. So the digital divide disproportionately affects people of color, even controlling for income and lower income Americans. Okay, the two sets of Americans who are suffering the most from the coronavirus. And I worry that in a year, the kids that my kid goes to school with, she goes to, my daughter goes to a school with a lot of uh, Title I kids, and a lot of them are not even going to class, either because they don't have connectivity or because they have to take care of a younger sibling because their parent has to work a service job or is an essential worker, that they'll have to repeat a grade they won't have the grades they need to go to college. So that's what I fear is that those folks that are suffering the most now because of the pandemic have this on top of it and are even going to be further behind. And it's really, really important to emphasize that this is not going away. If, God willing, we get a vaccine and the pandemic is has subsided within a year, we have to be prepared for the next pandemic, for the next natural disaster. I've already been told by educators and by my, my, my daughter's teachers that they're not coming back in the fall. And even when they do come back, which will be probably 2021, it's not going to be a situation where all the kids are in the school at once. Everything now, work is the same. Work is going to be hybrid online and in person. So really, everybody has to be connected. You know, look, I've been doing this kind of work trying to get people access to broadband and, and other communication services now for 30 years. And I talk to different groups and they say, well, this is not my first issue. This is, you know, this is my second issue. Well, I have to say right now it's become the issue mm -hmm. because you need it to really make a living for your schools, for your kids to get educated, to talk to your doctor, it's become core. Well, you've both made the case that the stakes are huge, that the challenges are also huge to, to addressing those stakes, even though you may differ in your view of how to get there. I want to say that I really appreciate it as the host of Intelligence Squared, where we debate on stage and try to be civil, that in this episode of Agree to Disagree, you did the same thing. You, you both brought a really 
open and respectful attitude towards one another and shed a lot of light on the issue for us. It's what we aim for when we do anything at Intelligence Squared. So for this episode of Agree to Disagree, I want to thank you, Gigi Sohn, and you, Christopher, you for joining us. It's really, really been an interesting and fascinating and I think a useful conversation. Here as well. It's a pleasure. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Agree to Disagree from Intelligence Squared U.S. Debates. Our debates are generously funded by listeners like you and by the Rosencrantz Foundation. Clea Connor is our CEO. Amy Kraft is Chief of Staff. Shay O'Mara is Director of Editorial. Connor Kerfman is our Creative and Marketing Strategist. Jennifer Zelmer is Senior Researcher. Aaron Dalton is our Radio Producer. Robert Rosencrantz is our Chairman. And I'm your host, John Donvan. Thanks so much for joining us. See you next time.